stop rambling and I'm going to welcome Sue Wilford, the Wood County Master Gardener volunteer that is joining us this evening. Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, thank you, and um, I'm, I'm excited about this topic because it is near and dear to my heart. I grew up very close to my grandfather who had acres and acres of apples, uh, apple orchards, and um, I have now had my own small apple orchard for um, about 15 years now. I have about 12 apple trees. So I'm hoping that this is a, an informational uh, presentation for you so that you too can get started or you might have questions about growing apples. They're not an easy thing to grow um, because of all the different uh, facets of it. So um, I'm hoping I can uh, share my experience with you today. Um, Already we okay. Um, we're gonna uh, the agenda. We're gonna talk about cultivars and the different varieties. We're gonna do where do you put your apple tree if you're gonna just uh, plant it. Um, a little bit about planting and then about training and pruning. Those are very important aspects. A little bit about the pest management and then when you get the harvesters at the end. One of the main um, Biggest um, in Wisconsin, um, the document that I like to use is the one that's called Growing Apples in Wisconsin. And let me see if I can share that with you here, what it looks like. Uh, this is the, um, the, it's 28 pages. It is in your resources. And um, this is just a lot of the things that it covers. It covers, a cultivar, planting, nutrition, weed management, training and pruning, harvesting, storage, insect pest, diseases, problem solving. It would be the first resource that I would uh, suggest that you go to if you are going to be um, looking at growing apples in Wisconsin. Now, um, And that is, um, if you want, you can just Google growing apples in Wisconsin. You can also go to the learning store and uh, click on um, home garden and click on fruits and you'll be able to find growing apples in Wisconsin. And okay. let's talk about cultivars. Those are the different varieties. There are thousands of varieties of apple. So you need to kind of narrow it down to figure out what kind of apple you're gonna plant, apple tree you're gonna plant. And it's gonna be a few years before you would be able to get apples from an apple tree. Um, but you also need to have two flowering apple trees. Um, it, just planting one tree won't do it unless you have trees in the neighborhood or maybe even a flowering uh, decorative crab apple tree in your neighborhood that can serve as a second pollinator, but you must have two in order for the apples to uh, cross pollinate. Um, in Wisconsin, we're zone three, four, and five. I live in zone four, which is central Wisconsin. And um, the northern is obviously zone three or in the southern is zone five. You wanna make sure that you double check what zone that uh, tree will grow in because otherwise you're just you know, wasting your money by buying the tree and then you wait two, three, four years to try to figure out and then the tree dies. You might want something that is disease resistance and some of the documents that I'm going to share with you talk about what um, disease resistance there is. Um, you want to know how long it's going to grow and because it has to ripen by mid-October. If it's not ripe by mid-October, you're not going to get any apples, especially at least central or even northern Wisconsin. Um, and you also want to choose trees that might ripen at different times. I have an early transparent that the, the tree um, ripens in August. And then I have some other ones that ripen in September and I have some that ripen about around the 1st of October so that you're not having all of your apples all at one time. Now, let me see if uh, the apple cultivars, I just wanna share with you if I can pull that up, uh, let's see. Uh, I don't see it. 
Anyway, there's a document called Apple Cultivars for Wisconsin. And in that it lists all the different types of apples, what zones they are, and um, if they're disease resistant, their growth habit, their ripening date, their uses, their color, it, it has an amazing amount of information. Again, that would be on that same website, um, the Learning Store, which is a w University of Wisconsin Extension uh, website and um, Apple Cultivars. It's also in your handouts that are attached to this, um, this presentation. You also want to uh, purchase it from a local reputable nursery. Usually they will guarantee a tree uh, for one year that if, if you plant it this spring, like next spring in 2021, if it doesn't survive the winter of 21 to 22, they would actually replace it. Most of the local reputable nurseries. And um, that would be my suggestion. Here's some of the pictures of some of the apple trees. Um, um, in my yard, this is a Zestar. This is kind of my most favorite apple, actually. Well, I have a, a lot of favorites, but Zestar is a, a variety. It was um, created out of Minnesota. So it's very winter hardy and it's got very large eating apples and it ripens about late August. As you can see here, these apples are very large. And so you can see under my tree here, I've had to actually support the branches because once the apples get that big, they don't, um, they pull those branches down and I'm afraid the branches will break. So there's a couple of trees that I have to do that for. This is the other one that has very large apples. And that is my hand next to this Wolf River. That is it, it's a late September, early October apple. It's very, very large. Again, this, I had to support uh, the branches. It's a fairly young tree. You can see this is the stem of the tree here and um, the trunk of the tree. And it's not very old, this tree isn't. Um, it probably was planted, I guess about 2013, 2014, somewhere in there. Um, a very good and eating and baking apple. Um, it doesn't take many of those to make an apple pie. Here's a couple of other cultivars that I have. I had submitted these to the uh, open class in the fair here in Wood County. This is a honey gold and a wealthy. Here's a Wolf River. There's the Zestar. Although it's green, it's mostly a red apple. And then this is a um, a Whitney crab, um, which is a nice large crab apple. Here's some of the other cultivars. There's, um, I have in my yard, I have a Beacon, I have a Harrelson. The nice thing about the Harrelson, and I love this apple, it was created out of uh, Minnesota, is that it keeps its shape when you put it in an apple pie. So the slices stay kind of in their shape. Um, then I have Macintosh, Cortland, Connell Red, which is a fireside, and then Wine Crisp. These are some other ones that they say would grow in this area, the Paula Red, Gala, Honey Crisp, uh, and Empire. So let's talk about site selection. You want to make sure that you have enough space for your tree, and um, you um, the standard trees, they grow really, really tall, 30 feet tall. Well, that would be very difficult to pick apples out of a standard tree. Most of your big apple orchards are standard trees, um, although they trim them so that they don't get so tall. But still, for a home gardener, that would be a very difficult tree to maintain. Now, I do have some standard trees in my yard, but they were here when I um, bought the property. Um, I have planted all semi-dwarf. Um, they still grow 10 to 20 feet tall. And I have a, an apple ladder that I use to um, pick them, uh, or a, a dwarf would even be smaller. So in a, if you have a dwarf tree, it'll produce in about two to three years, semi-dwarf three to four years before you will get produce, and then a standard is five to eight. But you do need space uh, in order to grow those. They don't like wet feet, so they don't like the roots to be sitting in wet area. Um, they don't like the... the be too cold or too, you know, too windy on top of a hill, so a slope would be preferred. Mine is protected by a lot of the, the buildings in our area. Uh, slight acidic soil, which would be a pH of six to seven, and a soil test would be recommended if you're just not sure where your soil, um, what, what kind of soil you are have. 
The only place you can get a soil test in the state of Wisconsin is right here in the Marshville area, uh, but that is the only testing site for the whole state of Wisconsin. You just have to take your soil test to uh, a local extension office and they will forward it up here. Um, very helpful. Um, also, you need full sun for about three fourths of the day. So you don't need sun the full day, but you do need sun at least for three fourths. And you wanna prepare your site. You wanna make sure you get the weeds out of there and adjust the soil for the soil test. So if you buy uh, a new plant, you wanna make sure that uh, you've got room when you're planting it for the roots. So the hole that you dig should be three to four times. It almost should be like a bowl shape um, because the, the roots grow out. They don't grow deep, they grow out. They kind of stay on the top few inches of the soil. So they grow out. And also you do not want to um, cover the root collar, the graft that is in the tree. Um, so you wanna have that graft two to three inches above the ground level. It is very important. You do not wanna plant your tree too deep. Um, if the tree is root bound from the container, sometimes if they haven't sold it one year and it stays in their container through the winter and then you buy it the next year, sometimes those roots will kind of end up being in a circle in those big pots. And so you wanna free them from the dirt. You wanna loosen them all up before you plant them. And then um, you wanna return that soil uh, over that root collar graft, um, but, but under the graft, you wanna make sure it's under there. And then you wanna make sure that you have at least water it thoroughly. You want one inch of water weekly. I would recommend getting a rain gauge, put it out in your yard, maybe in your apple, near your apple tree. Um, and then monitor that because it's amazing. You see, oh gee, it rained it all day, but you only got a quarter inch of rain. So it's important to monitor how much rain you're getting, especially the first year that you've planted that tree. You wanna mulch it, but don't put the mulch around the trunk area. Keep it away from the trunk, but mulch the rest over the, uh, over the uh, root area, out probably to the, almost to the drip line. Um, you want to stake your tree, especially after you've planted it, because strong winds come and they knock them over and they lean them and all that. And I just recently learned, and I hadn't known this before, but I recently learned um, that for dwarf and semi-dwarf, you should actually place a permanent stake. And you should place that right away. You don't want to put it in next year or the year after because you could hit a root and damage some of the roots. So you want to put that permanent stake in right away when you're um, planting your tree. And then you also want to protect them from unwanted pests, rodents, and um, deer. The, um, there's, it, we have a lot of deer in our area and they, and I don't have my yard fenced in or anything. They come in our freely. In fact, my neighbor says that when he used to go to work at 5.30 in the morning and he'd shine his lights in by my apple trees and the deer were standing on their hind legs eating my apples. But what they really do is they sort of damage the new trees, the new trees that I've planted because the new trees are small and they're, they're tender. And so those are the ones that the, the deer pick on. So there's a number of things you can do. Um, I hang soap. Um, and I learned that from the, the, the Door County um, orchards um, and some of the research that I've done. Uh, that doesn't defer them totally. Uh, you could put fence around them. You could, um, uh, there are some, uh, I think it's called, uh, I forget what it is, but there's some sprays that you can do to prevent the deer from eating on the small. And that's, uh, what I use on my small trees because um, they kind of make havoc with, with the new trees that I've planted. In fact, I have one tree, the wine crisp, who has not produced any apples at this point. And when it was first planted, the deer kind of devoured it. And so it is now growing back um, and um, I've got soap on it and I've, I spray it so that the deer will leave it alone. But anyway, and then the rodents, you want to protect um, the rodents, the rabbits, and the mice from eating at the trunk 
um, you know, inspect them just make sure that they're not getting in. And you might put a little uh, wire netting or something around there just through the winter um, to protect them. Now, I want to talk about, uh, for, first of all, before we go into training and pruning, um, Bethany, any questions that I can answer at this point? We have one question from Tatiana. Hello, very useful information for now. Can you comment about a permanent stake for a dwarf and semi-dwarf trees? How to make it in the long run? Thanks. A permanent stake would be like a fence post. Um, that's what I use is a fence post, or you could use, a, uh, I mean, I, I'm talking about a metal fence post. Um, so I put that in and then tie that, um, but make sure it's not tied so tight that you strangle the trunk. Um, you need a, um, a piece of cloth or a, a ribbon, a, a cloth, um, so that it's not, it's not gonna cut into the trunk. You wanna make sure that that's loose enough, but then it, when the wind comes, it, it, the tree can move, but the tree won't um, uh, bend over. And pretty soon you'll have a lopsided tree. So hopefully that helps. That's the only question we have at this time. Okay, so I'm gonna try to open up two documents. Let's see if I can get this done um, with our technology. One is training and pruning apple trees. And this is a, let me share this now. See if I can share it. Here it is. Can you see that? Nope. So this is training. You can't see it? Nope. Now I can. Got it. Okay. Okay, good. Training and pruning apple trees. This is again a Wisconsin extension document. And um, down here, you'll see that right in here, it talks about the 60 degree angle, which is the best angle for the tree. Okay, so you need to train your branches. They don't want it, they don't want it parallel to the ground or, or horizontal to the ground. You wanna have your branches coming out at about a 60 degree angle, 60 degree from the ground. And some of the ways to do that in this document, you can use some, um, here's a wooden spreader where you can you know, help that branch to just kind of bend out at that 60 degree angle. Um, the, the string, that would be pulling it down, a weight or even a rubber band. So in this one, this diagram shows you that this is way too far from the trunk. This is too close to the trunk. It's not gonna do you any good, but about halfway is probably just about right. I use like um, bags that you get onions in. I will put some rocks in them and then tie them onto the tree. That's what I use. Um, I have used some string to help uh, support trees. Actually, I use the string more often. I use it when a branch is getting heavy with apples and I wanna make sure I'm supporting it. So I tie it up to a, a, a branch above that. So that's, um, that is talking about training. Um, they've also got here some uh, toothpicks and clothespin spreaders too. But, but that's training it because when they're at a 60 degree angle, when they're at that, that great angle, they will have better ability to produce fruit. So that explains that. And this document also share, shows what you're doing at planting. This would be if you're planting just, you know, um, they call it a whip, if you're planting a whip. I've never just planted a whip, but this would be your first year pruning so you're kind of uh, opening up some of these branches and they're talking about the first year. And then, and you can read this for your own information. And here's a second, a second year and a third year. Um, of course, you know, when you get your tree and they grow, they don't look like this. So it's, it's information that's very helpful, but um, 
when you get out there and you're pruning your tree, sometimes it doesn't quite look like what the pictures are. And then the other one that I, I think, there's one more that I'd like to share. I'm hopefully it's on here. This is it right here. Okay, this is a document from um, Oregon. I usually try to use documents that are in the Wisconsin area, but this document from the Oregon State University is very helpful and it talks more about pruning. This is um, head cuts and this is thinning cuts. So let's talk about what those are. These head cuts, you're cutting off the end of the twig and what happens is that the, all of the buds below the cut is what will produce vegetation, okay? So you're, you're, you're topping it from that branch getting so long and elongated. That's a heading cut. A thinning cut is where you're actually cutting out right here and here, you're cutting out that, um, those branches. So you've only got two branches here, these two here and this one. So, that's thinning cuts. Then it talks about the correct way to trim a branch. So this is the bud right here, and this is the correct way that you want to cut at an angle right by the bud. But this is too long. This will rot and, and a possibility of disease. So you don't want to cut it so it's too long, and you don't want to cut it so you're really cutting into where that bud is growing. That's too close. Um, if you're having to cut off a large branch off of the tree, um, it's best if you don't just chop it off here because what'll happen is the weight of that branch will just cause this bark to tear off. So what you do is you, at, at A, you cut in a little bit about halfway into the bottom of the tree branch that you're gonna cut off. Then you cut off this part. So all of this will go away. So now you only have from B to the trunk to cut off and then you can cut off at, the, at that level. And you don't wanna cut off real close, but you don't wanna leave again a lot up there. And then the rest of this document is still more about pruning. And I wanna just share with you a little bit about what's on the branch of the apple tree. This is a spur. This is a flower bud, a bud scar, and a leaf bud, and a terminal bud. So let's go back to the spur. The spur, you never want to trim those off. That's where the apples are produced. And so those are very helpful. You don't, even when you're picking the apples, you want to try not to pick off the spur. That's very important. A flower bud, there will be a flower from this. It's more of a um, a swollen bud. It's not flat against the stem. Flowers will come out of this flower bud. A leaf bud is more of a triangle type bud and it's flat. And that leaf bud is where if you cut above the leaf bud, like, like it shows the correct way to cut on a leaf bud, you want the leaf bud, because that will create another branch, you want the leaf bud to be going to the outside of the tree towards the parameter of the tree. And, and you don't want the leaf bud to be going into the tree. You want the branches to be going out of the tree. The bud scar is the spot where the new growth has started. So from the tip of this branch to the bud scar would be in this year's growth versus last year's growth. This would have all been last year's. The terminal bud is the, the bud at the end. If you cut off the terminal bud, like we talked about earlier in this document, the, the, this will increase the vegetation along this, um, this branch. So hopefully that helps explain a little bit about what's in the branch. And then there's, um, most of my trees are vase shaped. So um, this is the vase or multiple leader. So the trunk only goes up so far and then my branches come out this way. I do have a couple that are more modified um, where the trunk is a little higher and then the branches come out, but this would be the central leader. So there's no right or wrong way, it just depends on what your tree is like. 
but I like the vase or the modified because it opens up the center of the tree and you'll see um, some of the trees that I am, um, we'll, we'll look at some of the trees that I have and you'll see how they're opened up um, in the center. And I always try to clean out the center of the tree when I'm pruning. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. So when you're training and pruning, I showed you those two documents. They are in that uh, the handouts um, that you um, that are included with this presentation. But uh, the training the branches at the best angle is the most important for those first few years. Trying to figure out, and you don't want branches on top of one another. You want to spread them out around. And because as soon as you get two or three branches that are really uh, covering each other, then the sunlight cannot get in there. So you want them spaced uh, pretty appropriately. Pruning is used, it opens up that tree for that maximum airflow and for the sunlight to get to all the branches. And that's what's really important. Um, but too much pruning stimulates more growth and water sprout. And I'm gonna show you, I have a tree that I have problems with water sprouts. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, you wanna prune once a year. I, Part of my problem with mine that had water sprouts is that um, I didn't know how, how I was, I didn't, wasn't pruning properly when I first moved on this property, which is about 15 years ago. Um, but you want to prune during the dormant season. I know it's cold in March, but you got to get out and prune the apple trees. Um, even February would be fine. February, March, before they start waking up. Um, and you wanna get rid of, first of all, the three Ds. You wanna get rid of anything that's dead or that looks like it's dying, diseased. You want anything that's crossing over on each other. Any branches that are touching each other, you wanna look back, take a look, which branch should you remove because you don't want them branching over, touching each other. And then anything that's growing up or down on the branch. So you, you pretty much cut off everything that's going down you don't want the branch to go down and you don't want the branch to go straight up. You want it to, to go out. And so anything that's growing up or down. You want to use sanitized tools, especially with fire blight because that's a bacteria. And you want to use a one in 10 bleach or a non-diluted Lysol solution and dip your tools in between cuts. Um, it's really hard because when you're up on that ladder and you're cutting, um, it's easy to do cut, 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 but, but you got to take your time. I have a spray bottle that I have that's got a one in 10 bleach solution in it. The problem with bleach solution is that it rusts your tools. So you have to take care of your tools later on um, and make sure they're oiled and, and taken care of clean. Fire blight is a bacteria and that gets into all of the um, tree. It can get into leaves, the branches, the trunk. Um, it's, it's a nasty thing. Um, but if you do see fire blight and there is a handout on fire blight that you wanna actually cut out all of that fire blight and at least four to six inches below the visible symptoms. After the spring pruning and before it starts to blossom, you wanna spray a dormant oil. And you can, uh, I pick mine up at the local Fleet Farm Menards hardware store, spray dormant oil. There's many different varieties, but it kills the eggs from the mites that have overwintered. And then when you spray, you cover all the branches and trunk. It's not a, uh, um, uh, it's a very organic kind of spray. Then water sprouts, if you get water sprouts and they will come from the pruning uh, wounds or from the where you've pruned, in early May or June, you just pick them off with your fingers um, because you don't want, the water sprouts are just things that branch up from the where you've pruned and they, they don't produce any apples, they don't produce any flowers, they just take away the energy um, from the tree. Now this, particular picture is um, of my Whitney crab. You'll see how this one is. Um, the, the trunk, the bottom of the trunk is down here and then all of these branches come out. 
But what you'll also see is all of these green sprouts up here. This is the tree that I have problems with because I didn't prune it properly years ago. And so I kind of fight with it every year about these water sprouts. Um, anyway, this one, those are all there. There's no flowers up there. Um, uh, they're just sucking energy out of the tree. Um, and, and this, I don't know what year this was, but this particular year I decided to kind of not do much with them to see if I could calm them down a little bit. Now here's another one. Now this is this is the same tree. This is a different year. And this is um, a beacon, but you can see how the, the branch is going. Now both of these trees are standard size trees. Um, the Zestar and the uh, Wolf River that I showed you earlier were semi-dwarf, but these were here when, when um, we bought the property. But uh, again, you can see how, um, how these trees are shaped, which would be the vase shape. So what about apples that fail to bear their fruit? Um, a few reasons why they may not bear fruit. Um, because of the angle of the branches, which is the reason why when you first get your tree, you wanna um, uh, train them to be at that 60 degree angle. Um, the yearly pruning, um, but don't over prune um, or over fertilize. When you over fertilize, that's why you should do a soil test to know what your soil needs. But if you over fertilize, it will produce a lot of leaf and vegetation, but it may not produce a lot of flowers. Spring frost damage. In 2016, we had spring frost damage where the temperature, the flowers were beginning to bloom and um, it got cold and I thought everything was fine because the flowers looked good, but it's the pistil, the center of the flower gets damaged. That year, I normally have 20, um, 25, 25 to 30 bushel of apple a year from my trees. And that year, I think I had about a bushel because in May it got too cold. Um, Pollination requirement, you need at least the two trees. So if you don't have two trees for cross-pollination, you may um, um, also mason bees are a good thing to, um, they're um, a bee that they don't sting, but they pollinate. They're found in the cracks of old buildings and you can actually get some mason bee houses and put those up. They're just small houses with little tubes uh, about the size of a straw in them and the mason bees are great pollinators. We happen to be beekeepers as well, so I have two beehives. And when those flowers are in bloom and I stand under the trees, the bees are just a buzzing. It's just, a, it's just an absolute um, music to your ears. Then biennial bearing, um, a lot of trees will go into every other year bearing. I have one right now, the transparent, yellow transparent that uh, had no fruit on it this year. I'm a, it's an old, old, old tree, and I don't know how many more years it's going to live, but um, I'll get two, three, four bushels off of it. And so probably next year, that's what will happen with that one. Uh, but it, biennial bearing can be caused by heavy pruning. Um, or, and if you do see where your fruit is just abundant on a tree, what'll happen is the apples will be very small because that tree is trying to fill out all of those apples and they only have so much energy. And so it would be in about June, it would be good to remove um, maybe even half of those apples off the tree. I know it's really painful to try to pick small apples off of a tree, but if you pick them off, um, your fruit will be bigger and it might stop it from being a biennial bearing. There is also information about that in some of the documents about actually spraying with seven um, I've never done that. I've just let my trees be what, what they will be. So some years I get a lot of apples and some years I don't get any off of a tree, um, but, uh, but that might be a reason. Now, a couple of, um, I had planted three semi-dwarf 
and it was like five, six, seven years I was going on, I was getting no apples. So I had um, elicited some information from our local horticulturist here in Wood County, and she told me um, all the reasons that what I've been telling you, and, and not, none of those seem to um, apply to my situation. So what she had told me to do is make a small circular slit, but not circular all the way around. You leave about maybe about six inches, but a circular slit, but don't connect it around the bark of the tree. And you need to cut that first layer, the cambium layer. And I did that in a number of spots on that tree, but you don't want to go into the next layer of the bark, which be the xylem layer. So I did that. And what she said was do that in late summer. And um, what, what happens is it'll help increase the sugar in the branches to produce them um, to stimulate flowering for the next year to stimulate the growth because they're actually setting the flower buds now in this fall time for next year. And I had three trees um, that were like that and they all started producing the following year when I did that. So, um, it, so sometimes you just need to um, research and look at where, where, uh, how come they're not producing apples after so many years? And I was getting a little bit more frustrated with them. So before we move on to um, pest management, uh, any questions? We have another one from Tatiana that she uh, gave us right as you started back up. So we'll go back to that one. About the voles, how long to keep the wire net on the adult tree? Wire net? Oh, for the, for the rabbits? Yeah, or voles rabbits. or other small critters. Small. Um, I would keep it on through the winter because it's mostly in the winter that they, um, they're looking for food. I would take it off because you don't ever want it to restrict, you know, sometimes those wires will get embedded into the bark and things and you don't want it to uh, cause wounds or anything around the base of the bark. So I would maybe wrap it during that the winter time, especially you know, sometimes if you have uh, snow banks that get real high and then they, they eat around, you know, the rabbits will call, call up on that snow. So you know, you have to do the best you can. Sometimes you just can't avoid it, but I haven't had any rabbits or uh, mice eat at my trees and I don't put anything around them, but I did have rabbits eat some of my grapevines this year. So around the base of the grapevine, which is very annoying. So, but they've Jeez. never done it before, so. I don't she's, know. She's following up with, do you install the net on the adult tree? Um, not, I, I would wait to see if you ha are having any issues. If you're seeing a problem, then um, if you're seeing some rodents or whatever starting to eat on the, on the mature tree, I would do it. But I wouldn't at this point, unless you saw problems. Jason, thank you. It sounds like we figured out her questions at that point or gave her direction at least. And then we have from Deb, where on the trunk do you cut the ring? Um, about six inches apart and at anywhere on that trunk. What I've done is doing about three or four cuts and I'll do it at different spots, but then, um, but you don't circle the tree. You and you don't connect the circle because you, um, and I do it, a, I don't know, I, I'd say three or four spots. That's hard to explain. But that, but I, now I, my um, one tree that I planted in 2014 has not um, produced. And um, so this fall, and it, the deer ate it, so this fall, now it's starting to survive and starting to grow. Um, I think it spent all of its time trying to build up its root system, but um, 
I did that for this that tree this fall. I probably cut it in the three, you know, maybe six inches apart, three or four different places on that trunk. And then um, I'm hoping that it'll produce apples next year, that I'll see some blossoms in spring. Any more? Not at this time, it looks like. As soon as I say that, one of them will pop in there again, though. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, well, let's talk about pests because uh, they're kind of common and, and um, these are some of the insect pests that attack um, apples and then the fungal diseases and then the fire blight, which I've talked a little bit about the bacterium. Um, the apple magnet, the plum curculio, the codling moth, the stink bug, the Japanese beetle that attacks everything. Uh, aphids, spider mites, and then the fungal diseases are apple scab, fly speck and sooty blotch, cedar apple rust, and then powdery mildew. I've got a few examples. Uh, this one is the sooty blotch and the fly speck. Now they don't really uh, affect, this is, um, this is fungal, and it does not affect the inside of the apple at all. And um, I do spray, um, um, periodically uh, with fungicide, but I still get this one. And as I was researching again for this program, I found out that it really, when you have extended periods of warm human weather that, that this sooty blotch and fly speck happen. Now this one happens on my honey gold, which is, was planted close to a large maple tree. And I'm thinking that that large, large maple tree in our yard kind of keeps this tree maybe a little too moist. So that may be why I get that. But it got, you can't just wash that off by put it, running it under the water and using a washcloth. I have to actually kind of scrub it with a scrubber to get that off. Um, but it doesn't hurt the apple at all. And the apple tastes just fine. It's not a, it's not a big deal. But uh, it, you know, you couldn't sell an apple like that, but I, I'm not, in the market for selling um, as I'm just a home grown home gardener. Then apple maggot, these um, flies, they lay eggs under the apple skin and then it becomes a larvae and then it becomes a little worm like that and it makes a tunnel. And that's where you get the worms in the apple, the apple maggot. Now, um, there's a whole article on apple magnets, so you can uh, look that up. And what they do say is that you should um, set traps out to monitor for apple maggots. And then you would know when to treat or when to not to treat um, for the apple maggot. maggot. Um, I was reading about it and they said a female lives about 30 days and lays about 300 eggs. So, um, they can be very detrimental to your apple orchard for sure. Apple scab is a fungus. It can affect not only the apple, but it can affect the leaves as well. And it can actually defoliate the tree with apple scabs. So a fungicide would be a, in order to um, uh, help with that. I even get a little apple scab once in a while, even though I do treat with a fungicide. Um, but Fall cleanup is really um, one of the, because the, it's on the leaves and so it stays and it overwinters. So by cleaning up the leaves in the fall would be helpful to help prevent for apple scab. Plum curculio, cur I think that's how you say that. This is a, um, it's like a weevil or a, a beetle that penetrates and put a pinpoint um, or it, it breaks the skin and then what happens is it lays eggs in there and that larva and then it develops that um, like a scab on the outside. It's not really a scab, but a blemish on the outside of the apple. Um, those can just be peeled off. It's not anything that would be detrimental to the apple. And I get one of, I get some of those once in a while as well um, on my apples. Um, but that's uh, due to an insect, uh, the, they call it a snout beetle or a weevil. Now, uh, the coddling moth is a moth 
and it has it'll sting and create like little holes in the apple but it normally ends entering the apple through the flower end or what they call the calyx is the blossom end of the apple and then it it works its way in through to the core um, and that larvae feeds in on that core of that apple. And that is an in insect or a moth. Now fire blight is a bacteria and one of the classic signs of fire blight is this shepherd's like hook on the end of the uh, branch. And so if you see that, that would be fire blight and you would wanna cut that out and get rid of that. Um, I, you might wanna burn it or you wanna dispose of it and get it out of there. Um, that can be detrimental, it can actually um, kill the tree. Now cedar apple rust is, in, you need two hosts for that. And um, most of it is, um, the first host would be a juniper. And if you have a juniper near your apple tree, so you really wouldn't want to plant an apple tree that would be near a juniper um, if you have that in your yard, because you would be prone to apple cedar rust. It is a fungal disease. Um, but it needs the two hosts in order for it. Now, one of the things I didn't include in, um, let me see if I can find it here. Oops. Uh, let's see if I can bring this up. Can you see this? Oops. Bitter pit and cork spot? Nope, can't see it. There we go. I think it's just because of the size of it. It just is slightly delayed when it's pulling it open for you. Okay. This is something I didn't include in the PowerPoint, but then I realized I deal with this all the time. Um, it's, um, my apples don't quite look like that. They're the blemish is not that big on the outside of the apple. It, it, you might see a little bit of a blemish on the outside, but when they, and they don't, they aren't like that when you pick the apple. It, it happens after you pick the apple and they're sitting a while, they get this bitter pit and corks spot. Um, and they actually get, it goes into the apple, the meat of the apple a little bit. And um, there's a, a number of reasons and I haven't quite figured out how to solve this problem yet, um, despite even the information that I have. Um, but I was just peeling some of my um, uh, Wolf River apples, that big apple. And um, this document says that bigger apples are more prone to it, which um, that the Wolf River is a big apple. Um, and what happens is um, you can peel that, th those little spots that are inside the apple, you can peel that away and it doesn't affect the rest of the fruit, but it's just a kind of annoying that you have to peel half of the fruit away. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to do curb that is um, uh, with calcium. So I spray my apples with calcium and I also put some calcium around uh, the drip line in the beginning of the summer. Um, it will be, the calcium will be taken up by the roots, but then there gets to be a point where the, it, it can no longer be absorbed by the apples. So they talk about applying calcium sprays and even they talk about dipping them in a calcium solution after post harvest. So I've never done that, but that, uh, that is a recommendation. So maybe next year I'll try that, dipping them in a calcium chloride solution uh, once I've picked them. Um, I get a, I got about, I don't know, five or six bushels from that tree, but um, it would might be worth it um, to do that. Um, if, not sure, but that's a called bitter pit and cork spot. Not all of my, not all of my trees get it. I've got two particular trees that are more prone to it than the others. One is the wealthy tree and then this, um, um, Wolf River tree. Not sure why, but you know, each, each cultivar is a little bit different. So I wanted to share that. And that document is in um, with the rest of your document. 
Let's talk about pest and disease control. Managing these pests, there's lots of them. Um, that's what makes it a little challenging to grow apples. Um, it's not. It's not just plant a tree and let it grow and eat the apples. It's just you've got to kind of, kind of contend with all of the pests that come along. Um, but but what we try to do is integrated pest management. And what integrated pest management means is that you try to integrate all different kinds of ways to control the pests, whether it be insects, fungal diseases, uh, rodents, deer. You're trying to do um, uh, the best that you can using the least amount of chemicals that you can um, or organic kind of chemicals so that you're not um, hurting the pollinators and, and whatnot. So uh, you might want to choose disease resistant varieties. Um, you want, if you're trapping for insects and removing the juniper so that you don't get the cedar rust. Um, um, and when you're trapping for insects, you want to trap them, to count them, to figure out do you have a problem or not that you need to actually um, do some spraying or a, a different intervention. You want to clean up the fall fruit, the leaves and the branches from the orchard. That helps. You don't want to leave it a mess um, under there. When I prune in the spring, I take all of my branches and I, we have a wood. So I take them all out to the woods and um, uh, in, we have a brush pile out there that I, I don't leave any of the branches laying around. Uh, the deer, we talked a little bit about that. So paint from the tree, fencing, uh, resistant um, sprays. Um, and then how much can you tolerate before seeking intervention? So, you know, I've kind of lived with the bitter pit and I kind of live with the sooty fly spec. Um, and, um, but, you know, I, I could maybe treat more, but maybe I can tolerate it also. So, yeah, and I do, like I said, I do get some apples with apple scab on. I get some apples with, um, 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 what was the other one? Anyway, um, the plum coolio, I think. Anyway, insecticides and fungicides, we wanna use the least invasive and least uh, costly for our environment. Um, you could do it preventatively or curatively. So preventatively means that you're gonna spray at a regular routine. Um, before bloom, it would be like a seven to 10 days and after bloom, 10 to 14 days. Curatively would be that you're monitoring and you're using degree days. And I'm gonna talk about degree days in a little bit and that you're monitoring for when those um, animals, the, the pests are there. Apple maggot is one of them, that, that, that worm that burrows in and creates like a track in the apple. Um, the sticky red severe covered with tanglefoot um, and those insects. Um, you would need one or two in a small tree or five or more in large trees. Then you could bag the apples. And they said that you take just like a baggie tie it around the apple, but you put a little hole in the bottom so the moisture from the, you know, that's in there actually can uh, seek out, but um, that would protect the apple from uh, these kinds of insects. So if you had a small tree and you only had 30, 40 apples on a tree, you probably could do that. I have 12 trees. I don't think I could bag apples when I'm getting 25 to 30 bushel. So it wouldn't be, that's not an option for me to bag my apples. If you're gonna use any kind of sprays, um, you wanna cut the grass before spraying. My grass is full of clover. And so it's just um, in there and the bees love the clover. So I, my husband cuts the yard before I spray. And, um, and I only spray when the wind is very, very low and almost non-existent because you get the drift and plus it gets on, on you. I spray late in the day when the pollinators have gone back to the nest. I said, I am a beekeeper. And of course you're not spraying the apple trees during um, bl blossom time. That's a reprieve, you don't have to spray them during that time, but they still, they're all around. So I spray very late in the day when they've all gone back to their nest. So in the summer, it's like eight o'clock at night that I'm spraying. Um, choose chemicals, the least toxic and, and refer to organic. Um, if possible, uh, use proper clothing according to the uh, instructions. I always wash all of my clothing after I spray and I jump in the shower um, just because, and uh, I think that's the best way to um, protect myself. 
And then um, you must follow the law on all of the labels because it is the law. Um, so you have to use the pesticide, insecticide, um, fungicide uh, according to the label. A couple of terms that they use is RE REI and PHI. REI is a restricted entry interval. That's how long you have to remain out of the area after an application. It might be 24 hours, um, something like that. PHI, pre-harvest, that's how long, if you're gonna harvest, if the apples are getting ready to harvest, you're not gonna wanna spray because it might be 10 days, might be 14 days, but um, how long since you sprayed before you can um, harvest. Now there's three documents that are, um, and I'm not sure if I can bring any of these up, but we're gonna try. Um, one is the, they're all IPM management of, of apple trees. Um, let me see. Here's the organic one, which is the third one listed. Let's look at that one. Um, this one in particular is an organic, it's from the National St Sustainable Agricultural Information Service. I'm gonna go down to page 27. So hang on here. And it talks about disease resistant apple varieties. So you can see what kind of disease. This is um, uh, scab, uh, the code is up here. Bitter rot, scab, mildew, fire blight, cedar rapid, cedar apple rust. So it tells you what are um, in the codes related to that. And so that goes, it's a long list of apples. So you could go to this um, resource. Here's um, Harrelson down here, okay? So, and then there's codes that tell you, it would be a resource for you to look at, um, especially for disease resistance. It, it didn't list apple maggot or um, plum coolio in those. Well, let me see if I have another one here. Um, okay, this one. This is the Apple IPM for beginners. Can you see this? Okay, this is from Cornell University. Um, this is actually zone five or six, so you have to take that into consideration. But I found it to be very helpful, um, a good resource, it's many pages, it's 41 pages. Um, but let me just take you down to a couple of sections. Again, it, it goes through all of this, okay? All of these diseases we've been talking about. And, um, let me just go down a little bit farther, hang on. Okay, here's the scouting calendar. And it goes in through these stages of when your, app, when your um, tree is starting to bloom. Here's a dormant stage, okay? That's the, where the, the apple buds are gonna come out. This is the silver tip. Here's a green tip. Um, this is the quarter inch green, half inch. And here you've got the bud or the cluster. The tight cluster, this is where your apples are, the bloom is gonna happen. And then your pink blood and it goes on. And it talks about what, what pest action you should take and how to follow up um, with that. And so here's apple scab, apple scab. Um, uh, it just talks about what you're, what you're supposed to, here's spraying a fungicide for apple scab, but in, it's, it's a great resource. Here's mites. And it takes, takes, tells you what to do for those pests, um, okay? And it is an IPM. And then it, it's just 41 pages, so there's a lot more in here um, than that. Okay. And this is the last one. This is the University of Wisconsin document about apple pest management for home gardeners. It's a shorter document, 
but it is also very helpful. It talks about the disease resistant varieties and where you can go for that. Um, then down here, it starts talking about the different diseases. Um, let's see, here's the coddling moth, the plume curlio, and it also then tells you how to manage it. Okay, so it's those are three resources that you have. Um, um, and they're all in the, the handouts um, that you can go to. And this is another document that's in your hand and it goes to the bud stages. And here's one, two, it's, it's the silver tip, the green tip, the half inch green tip. But in this document, um, it also tells about the bud development and how cold, how much you will lose depending on the temperature. And so it says average temp for 10% kill. So at stage one, if it's 15 degrees, you will have 10% kill at stage one. At, if it's two degrees, this is Fahrenheit, you will have 90% kill at stage one. So you know what stage it is and, and if, if you're going to have um, freezing of your apple orchards, of your apple blossoms. So, but again, it works through those stages and everything's related to those stages in many of the documents. And then the last thing I wanna share is, um, well, um, before we go on to harvesting, is the Wisconsin Pest Bulletin. You can go on to their site, which is the Data Services um, Wisconsin, and you can receive a weekly update via email. And what they do is they, they really were designed for agriculture. And they, they put out a weekly bulletin about all of the different pests and all the diseases that are occurring around the state of Wisconsin. And that's very interesting to um, read what's going on and um, what, what people should be doing, especially when they talk about degree days. Degree days are measuring the heat that's accumulated over the season. So it predicts the timing of when certain pests will occur in your orchard. So what they do is they take the average high and the, and the average low, they subtract 50, and then they add it to the accumulated degree days that have up until that point. So an example is 85 was the high, low was 65, an average is 75. They take 50 away from that. So the degree day for that day is 25. And then they add that to the previous totals. Now I will show you, um, oops, here. This was an August bulletin and I just pulled this one out about apple maggot. And so they had said flies are expected to persist in orchards for several more weeks or until there's 2,800 degree days. And down here they say August 26 was 2,400 for Beloit, 2,364 for Madison, and 2,191 for Racine. So apple maggot, maggot was still going to be prevalent until they got to the 2,800 degree days. And But they did say has been variable but generally low this season. Continued maintenance of red severe traps is recommended through early September. And this was an August bulletin. So it helps you to understand that those bugs are still around for the orchards and that you need to take precautions, whether it's bagging your apples or um, spraying an insecticide or whatever. Um, so questions so far about pest management before we go on to harvesting. We're almost we, getting to the end. <laughs> we do have a few more questions that we can uh, get caught up on here. So we have from Deb, is there one fungicide for all forms of fungus? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, You would have to, uh, no, I, I, it, probably not. Um, my guess would be probably not. You would need to look at the fungicide and see what it is, um, what it controls. Um, one of the main, uh, one of the uh, fungicides, which is Captain, 
uh, is a common fungicide and um, I don't know if it controls all of those areas, but that is actually a fungicide that, that I use as captain. Um, but I, I can't answer that question, I don't know. And Deborah was wondering, are pine trees like white pine also hosts for cedar apple rust? No, it would be, just be the juniper. Just the and, juniper. And Joyce asks, this year, our apple tr apples were misshapen and had indentations all over the, the fruit. It's not a direct question, but I think she's wondering if, if you have any ideas of what might have caused that and how she could prevent that. Um, there is one of these, I'm not sure what it is, but there is one of those insects that causes deformity. And I don't know, um, I have, I always have a few apples that seem like they're deformed. I don't know why it is, um, but I, I would suspect it's one of the insects I'm not positive. That's it for the current questions. Okay. 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 Now we're on to harvesting. That's the fun part because you get to pick all that fruit. Um, when do you know that it's time to harvest it? Well, the skin color, they start to get, if it's a red apple, it starts to get really red and um, you know that the, the skin color changes. The ground color, which is actually, it's in the stem of the fruit. Um, where the stem comes out of, it starts to change from that dark green that it was when it was just an immature apple, starts to change to a brighter green or lighter or even yellow. The seeds also change to uh, brown. They don't, maybe they don't turn totally brown, but they get more brown. If their seeds are white, they, it would not, they would not be ready to pick. Uh, the flesh softens a little bit. Of course, you can taste the apple. That might be a way of telling. Um, apples start falling from the tree. Um, our apple orchard is right outside uh, from our kitchen area. And as we sit at our kitchen table, and so all of a sudden we say, oh, that apple, that tree over there has got three, four on the ground. So we would go out and check it to see, is it ready? The way, um, the way we check them, most of the ways by the seeds is one of the ways. Tasting is another. But the biggest thing is that when you twist the fruit and you lift it, so you don't, when you pick an apple, you don't just pick it off the tree. You twist it and lift it. And if it comes off, it is ready to be picked. And because pretty soon a little bit of a wind is going to just knock them right off onto the ground. Um, you also want to be careful when you're picking the apples that you don't bruise them um, or that you don't remove um, the spur, as I talked about earlier. Um, you want to also very gently place them in the box or bag. Maybe um, sometimes what I'll do is put two boxes on top of one another um, so that I don't have to bend down so far. I use an apple picking bag. And I don't have to bend down so far to place those apples in the box um, just, um, so that they bounce around in the box. So it's very, you have to be very careful about bruising. Now, some of the things that um, we use is one is the apple ladder, and I showed you the picture. Um, maybe not, there's another picture coming up, I think, of the apple ladder. This is a tripod apple ladder, and I would recommend this if you're going to be doing any picking that is high up in your trees. Even the dwarf, the semi-dwarf trees, I need this apple ladder to get to the top of those trees. Um, it's a tripod. Uh, mine doesn't have the this chain or whatever this is in between here, um, but my, I use my apple ladder extensively. I even use it to wash my windows because it's very, very, very sturdy. I can be assured I'm not going to tip that ladder over. It doesn't look like it, but it is very sturdy. And what I do is um, when I'm, I'm trying to get underneath the branches and into the, towards the middle of the tree, is I will spread that one leg way out 
and then I'll pull that ladder, the top of that ladder, I'll pull it up and it'll be up underneath those branches and I'm, I'm able to get up into those trees uh, quite readily. So I would recommend an apple ladder versus a step ladder. That is just, that is way dangerous. Uh, that's an old fashioned picking bag, but there are many different varieties. It put you know, straps around your neck and around your waist. And then when, when you have a full bag, the bottom of that bag opens up and you can let those uh, apples just gently fall. Um, And now you can put that long handled um, um, apple up there. And the um, apple, you can just kind of tug on it a little bit and the apple will fall into that basket and you can get those. Also the tools that you're gonna need is obviously your pruning tools, um, your long handled pruning shears and uh, nippers. Make sure when you have pruning shears that you don't have the kind that um, the blade goes flat against the opposite side, you want a bypass pruners. You don't want, because if you use the kind that goes onto the metal itself, you're squishing the branch instead of uh, you know, slicing it. And you want your tools to be very, very sharp um, when you're, and get them sharpened every year and, and clean them up. Last thing is um, keeping records. I keep records of everything I do with my apples. When, what year I planted them, when I planted them, um, uh, when I pruned them, any monitoring of the insects, um, anything that I'm doing, any spraying that I do, the harvest of them, and the amount of fruit produced. I know from year to year how much each particular apple tree produced. If they produced one bushel or if they produced, um, I had 16 bushel off of my beacon this year. Um, so I, and I record that. Uh, what I do is have a calendar next to my chair that I sit in in the evening when I'm watching TV or reading. And um, every day that I come in and I've done something there, I write it on my calendar, but I eventually put that into um, uh, a spreadsheet, uh, an Excel spreadsheet on my computer to keep uh, track of it so I can go back and look. So, you know, I know what year I planted them. I know how much apples was this year or last year or three years ago. Also where to store them, you know, the, um, if the garage gets too cold, um, the garage is good for a while, but um, you don't want the apples to freeze. And then I usually put them in my basement. Um, I had about 22 and a half bushels this year, a little bit less than normal but I have two bushels left in my basement, which will make great apple pies for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, and I will be freezing them. And as I told my husband, I sure wish I had a root cellar like my grandfather had. Boy, that was the cat's meow, but don't have that. So, and then you need to, what, what are you gonna do with all your apples? You know, I make applesauce, apple butter, apple pies, apple cakes, apple crisp, slices. I make apple slices on the dehydrator and I do apple roll-ups on the dehydrator. From, those are great for my grandkids. And I have an apple press and a steam juicer, which I make apple juice and we drink apple juice all winter long. And I give away lots of apples as well. So um, one last, here's um, in my garage one year when we picked all of the apples that we picked. This is our apple press. These are my grandchildren and my husband and I'm back here cleaning out the apples. I just, what we do is wash them and take out the flower end and then the rest of it gets crushed in the uh, apple press and the juice drips out the bottom and then we can that. Um, and the grandkids, um, we've had a lot of kids over to make apple juice out of our apple press. And here's, here's that same Whitney crab with the uh, water sprouts up above, the nuisance water sprouts. And here's the apple ladder. There's my husband who's uh, helping me pick and the apples that we're picking. So, questions?
We don't have any current questions, but we'll give you all a few moments here to if you think of any or somebody's currently typing something, we'll give it a few minutes so that we can get all of those questions in. While we take these few minutes, I'm just going to go over a couple of leftover things. I had a few questions wanting to make sure that we had access to the resources that Sue mentioned this evening, including the PowerPoint itself and then all of those handouts. Uh, a reminder that I did send in the email that included the uh, Zoom invitation link there was also the link for the Google Drive folder, which has all of this information in it. I will send out another email uh, late this week, probably, that will include a link to the finalized YouTube video in case you wanted to be able to look back at it again. But I also include that link to the Google Drive one more time to make sure that you have that uh, available and easily accessible for you. Um, I do not currently have these handouts available at the library just because with the library's adjusted hours, it has made it more difficult for me to put these things together. But I will work at getting those available as well. And hopefully when I send out that email, I'll be able to mention that you can also pick up uh, printed copies of these uh, different handouts at the adult information desk on the second floor. It looks like we have a few questions as I was rambling that were dropped in. So we will go ahead and start answering some more questions here. So Deborah asks, how are you pruning your trees to maintain an open tree without new headers taking over? Well, I prune every year. I, I prune every year and I, and I, um, what you have to do when you're pruning is again, you, first of all, you get rid of the dead, diseased and dying branches. And then the ones that are going up and down, and then you step back and you say, okay, is this the branch I should prune? Or is that the branch I should prune? Um, you want to make sure that there, that you keep that center, especially when you have a vase shaped tree to keep it, um, open in the center. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question or, um, and you know, if you have an apple tree that's not been pruned for years and years and years, you don't wanna drastically go and prune the whole thing. You wanna do about a, I'd say a quarter to a third a year. So it could take you three to four years to get that tree looking um, like it's um, a decent, pruned apple tree. Um, because if you prune too much, well, you'll end up with the water sprouts like I do on my problem tree, or um, the tree will be in such shock that you're going to have some issues with it. So you don't want to, the th rule of thumb is only prune a third, a third, a third over three years. But even if it's a a tree that's been totally neglected and like you just bought a property and you've got this apple tree and you wanna revive it, I would say about a quarter and then you do it over many years. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Joyce would like to know, do you know if pizzazz apple trees are available to the home gardener? Uh, I have. I have no idea. Pizzazz is a, is a variety. I don't know. You could check with a local nursery. Um, some, you know, a local reputable nursery to see if it's even available. I don't know. And you would have to make sure that it's the zone that you live in. This would be zone four here, wherever, whatever zone you live in, because you, you don't want to plant something that's not going to survive. And just a little feedback for you, Sue. Deb said this is one of the best presentations she's ever listened to. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much. I I've learned a I'm lot over the years. <laughs> It's always a learning process and it's an ongoing learning process, let me tell you. Apple trees are not the easiest to deal with. Zebra asks, are you pruning off branches trying to be the header every year? I'm not sure what she means by trying to be the header every year. 
I'm wondering if if she's using the word header at, in the same place as the water sprouts or water spouts, whatever you were calling them. Oh, water. I'm wondering. I'm not um, sure. I'm I'm not. She said no. I was incorrect. Thank you, Tebra. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a gardener. <laughs> Could she explain the question in another way? The branch heading to the sky every year. Oh, the lead, uh, the lead in a in a in a tree where the branch goes straight up, the trunk goes straight up. Um, I had that with one of mine, and. Um, I find that a little bit more difficult to prune um, because I'm, I'm, I have been hesitant, but I did cut it off at the top because what was happening with mine was that a lot of the branches were coming out of the top of the tall center trunk and I didn't have a lot of branches at the bottom, you know, of the trunk. So I had talked to the horticulturist in Wood County here and he said to, um, uh, if I trimmed off the top, cut it, you know, uh, like six inches off the top, that would help uh, those branches from the side to start sprouting out, which it did. And, um, but it is a leader, the trunk is a leader and then the branches are coming out of that. I find that more difficult to prune for some reason. I'm not, I'm, I'm not an expert on that one for sure. So I'm not an expert on any of them. I'm, I'm just a common ordinary person learning how to manage these trees. So well, you're clearly a fount of excellent information. It sounds like everybody was able to take something from this presentation. Tatiana said, agree, very interesting and useful information. Okay, good, I'm glad. I'm, hopefully they can be enthusiastic about growing their own apple trees, so. And Deborah said, thank you, Sue. Very good presentation. Okay, thank you. So I am going to close out one more time here, just in case we have any more questions that somebody throws in there. Um, as I said, I am going to send out another email. Uh, if you are having issues accessing that email, I did have somebody say that they're unable to access the links that were in there. And if anybody else is having any kind of an issue like that, you can always email me at B Pearson, B P I E R S O N at marshfieldlibrary.org. And let me know what you're looking for, what, what you aren't able to do if you have any specific questions. Additionally, if you end up think of, thinking of any other questions related to this program, you can send them to me that way and I can send them over Sue's direction so that she can help you with those questions or give you a good direction for where to find those answers. Uh, and then finally, if there are any topics that you would like our Garden Guru volunteers to discuss in the new year as we will be taking off for December. Uh, you can email me, you can drop them in the chat right now. Anything that, any ideas that you might have, any specific topics that you're dealing with at home, whether it is your pest control, specific pest issues you have, if there's something that you're interested in starting doing and you would love to hear some more information, or you've gotten the basics down of something specific and you like that next step, please let us know whether it's emailing me or saying it in the chat right now. I'll give you a minute or so here, but I think that is gonna be wrapping us up for this evening.